This is a little bit uh, once over lightly in a, in a 20 minute session, but just going to describe what a heat engine is, market demands and the California ISO duck, which we've already heard about once before, some of our options for power conversion systems, desirable attributes of a heat engine, some comparisons, recommendations and hopefully questions at the end. So what is a heat engine? Very simply put, it's an assembly of equipment designed to convert thermal energy into mechanical work. We hear a lot about thorium, we hear a lot about molten salt reactors. We're actually in the business of producing a product and one of the most rational products to make is electricity. The power conversion system must serve the nuclear system. It may seem like a no-brainer, but um, I think that's crucial. And we've targeted some particular performance attributes in the work that we've done um, that exceed today's requirement. And the primary reason for doing that is to make it harder for authorities to say no to lifter and MSR technology based on quasi-technical reasons like you can't ramp up and down fast enough or you can't do this or that. Market demands, um, love them or hate them, um, the market increasingly is having to deal with an increased proportion of renewable energy or non-dispatchable energy and that demands faster ramp rates up and down. It requires some form of energy storage in the system overall, some sort of supplementary energy addition, and that means that gas firing uh, has some, some value. Uh, just talking briefly about the uh, Cal ISO duct, this is what you get when you have large scale solar. So here's a, a picture of demand in 2012 and nice evening peak, we go from 22 gigawatts up to um, 24, no dramas. Projecting forward over time, uh, solar obviously has a certain time of day where it's most effective and the, the, the net impact of large solar is predicted by the California Independent System Operator to push the demand from other generation all the way down to 12 gigawatts um, around uh, early afternoon but then you've got this very sharp rise in demand uh, topping out at 26 gigawatts and I can tell you as a guy who deals with real-time power generation a lot that is a very challenging curve to deal with if you shift on that curve one way or the other by 15 minutes or you have one plant that fails to meet its um, merit order then you're in trouble so we're going to need fast ramp rates, we're going to need a lot more spinning and regulating reserve and there's going to be a requirement for fast response peaking power for when plants go down or fail to start at the due time. Now molten salt technologies, lifter MSR can play a part in that. I'm not saying that they should or should not, I'm just saying that they can. So one of the options is molten salt storage. So if you design a system that has a 50% load factor with thermal storage, you can follow that Cal ISO duct curve for 2020. Co-firing of natural gas is another option. University of California Berkeley have developed a combined nuclear and gas-fired cycle proposal. It's a really good example of providing spinning reserve and peaking service on demand while being extremely efficient with its use of fossil fuels. So some of the work we've done in this space, we're targeting 10 to 20% per minute ramp rates. Um, uh, we've, we've developed some options for 10 minute notice ahead uh, gas co-firing where we can boost the net output of the plant to plus 30% above the nuclear island. 30% peaking, uh, I need to say, is not enough to satisfy the requirements of um, that Cal ISO duck, but it is, um, a very helpful addition and specifically it can run continuously. Storage is great, but often it's not enough to get you through a whole week or more importantly say an entire month. Um, also looked at uh, black start and support of grid restoration if you have a grid emergency and you, you lose the farm. Tripping to house load with indefinite idle for molten salt reactors. Um, and we've, our co-fired option has excellent segregation between the gas turbine piece and the steam turbine part of the system 
um, providing really high levels of fault tolerance because a lot of people don't like mixing dangerous natural gas with safe nuclear power. So heat engine options, um, steam turbine, the Rankine cycle, open cycle gas turbine, closed cycle Brayton, supercritical CO2, simple helium, um, and then you've got your helium with multiple reheat, recuperate and intercool, more complex cycle but more efficient. We can uh, put together combined cycle rank and uh, Brayton's together and we can even get down into some exotic creatures of binary systems where we have mercury in one part, steam in another, boiling aluminium, chloride, um, air breathing, hybrid combined cycles or air breathing open cycle Brayton, which I think is a promising field for research. So what are we looking for in terms of characteristics? We want something safe that's efficient, but it needs to be efficient both thermodynamically, financially, and in its use of all resources. Be careful to define what you mean by the word efficient when you use it. We want something that's reliable, available, robust, can tolerate faults, low maintenance requirements, easy to maintain, low cost if possible, and if possible, a diversity of supply. If you can um, get on to turbo machines with multiple vendors, then you've got a better chance of getting competitive pricing and not being held to ransom. So we want flexibility, ramping, we want something that's scalable, adaptable, something we can upgrade uh, if we find a better widget. Something that has to be sympathetic to the nuclear island and importantly has to be environmentally benign during all stages of its life cycle. If we're feeding it large boxes of fluffy yellow ducks at some point in its life cycle, it's not a suitable solution. So talking about helium bratons for a moment, very good with high temperatures. Higher temperatures enable higher efficiencies. And if you're working at 900 C, you can get to 54% efficiency for a triple pressure recuperated and intercooled helium Brayton in a closed loop cycle. Um, they're not used commercially and the largest one uh, built so far as a more simple version of a helium Brayton was Oberhausen 2 which is just 50 megawatts. Due to the fact the physical characteristics of helium are radically different from air and particularly the speed of sound, the blades in the compressor and turbine look nothing like what they do in an air breathing machine. And there's a lot of configuration choices. One compressor with one turbine, two compressors with one turbine, one, two or three expansion steps. Here's some work done by uh, University of California, Berkeley in 2004. And this is an example of a three pressure um, recuperated and intercooled Brayton and with a LP uh, intermediate pressure and high pressure turbine, big fat recuperator on the end. Recuperator performance is critical for Brayton's, well, and in general, regardless of what the working fluid is. That's what a real machine looks like. That's a 286 megawatt. Uh, and this is just the turbine part, so compressor sections here, uh, offtake for an intercooler, uh, and here's the uh, turbine section there, and that's a 286 uh, megawatt machine. It's only 42 feet long, um, 10 or 12 metres in uh, proper, proper units. Um, advantages, they're relatively compact, they can be very efficient, they're and the, the way they reject their heat to the environment is very good for um, low temperature energy use such as uh, desalination. Um, disadvantages, pressures, reasonably high pressure but not too bad. The big problem, one of the challenges I see is helium is a very slippery uh, material, a little bit like tritium, it loves to walk through hot metal. Not as bad but it's still an issue keeping it in place. And also the, t the turbo machinery typically wants to rotate at some speed greater than synchronous speed or 3600 RPM here in North America. And there's nothing off the shelf. Anything you do in this space will be specifically built for the task. Um, supercritical Brayton cycles, they're taking advantage of lower compression work. 
when dealing with a supercritical fluid. Um, they do require very high pressures and that also happens to coincide with the peak cycle temperature. Um, they do create very, very compact turbo machinery which is one of their potential advantages. Um, high speed turbo machinery, so you're automatically talking about a gearbox. They have an efficiency advantage at moderate temperature um, and for reasons I can't explain, they don't seem to be as good as the helium brayton at, at higher temperatures and the efficiency stakes. Critical thing, they require a really good recuperator and they benefit greatly from a low temperature heat sink and, a, and a very good heat exchangers. So compact heat exchangers are part and parcel of supercritical Brayton. You can't really do them without those heat exchangers. So here's just a schematic for general information. Um, and the performance of these recuperators here is absolutely crucial to the overall cycle performance. Um, some of the challenges, uh, dealing with quite high pressures, which means creep strength issues for your heat exchangers. Uh, the compact size of the turbo machinery can be an issue um, yet to be proven. This is an assertion. It's, I can't point to any data, but one of my concerns, the very compact size, you will be punished severely for any tip clearances on the blades. Um, they're small enough that I also wonder a little bit about the mechanical strength of the turbines themselves and they're high speed machines so you're dealing with high speed reduction gearboxes which are difficult animals to live with at the best of times. And they don't seem to do so well above 850C but that's not really an issue in the current environment. Um, boiling aluminium chloride, I don't know anybody that's ever done any serious work on this, it's been posed as a theoretical. Um, I can't ever imagine it working. We've got uh, mercury and uh, water binary. Again, mercury, bad stuff, doesn't work, leaks. Combined cycle with uh, nuclear co-firing. There are some options there that might be worth a look in the, and I recommend anybody with an interest in this area have a look at the University of California Berkeley papers on this and presentations. Last of all, um, I haven't done much work on this, but for environments where you don't have access to uh, water, um, an air breathing Brayton um, with recuperation and, to, and a single reheat step, I think that's got some potential. So it's 700C fluid temperature, air temperature. You're talking about 40% efficient, and that's, that's good, that's acceptable. And there may be a chance with the air breathing break and to adapt that from existing bits and pieces from machines. And there are some commercial examples out there working at much higher pressure ratios. Steam turbines, um, any size you like, you can get efficiencies in the order of 50% for the power island or power conversion system. And so, but you've got to get over this fundamental challenge that the salt would like to freeze in the steam generator, and that is a, that is a problem. Uh, and they're not that expensive, so Flaminville, the power island there, I think costs around 200 euros per kilowatt. Not expensive at all. Um, very reliable, continuous improvement, nothing fancy, everybody knows them and they do perform better if you've got cold water, uh, currently temperature limited but these temperatures are quite friendly to current molten salt reactors with say 700C at the outlet. They do potentially consume a reasonable amount of cooling water but any heat rejection process does. So just in terms of recommendations, um, love them or hate them, make sure that your power conversion system is duck friendly because that's the reality of today's market and they're going to be around for a while. Uh, try and look at the world through risk-corrected spectacles. Are you building a reactor? Um, is that where you want your focus to be or do you want to build this new fancy way of doing things in terms of the heat engine which may hurt you later on? Uh, and consider the needs of your application from the top down. Set some performance criteria, stick to that criteria and use that to evaluate your design choices as you go. Um, and yeah, 
an important final point, I not, haven't really spoken to this at all, but just remember also that the most economic solution is unlikely to be the most efficient one. So be careful of spending a lot of energy and resource pursuing the most economic, oh, sorry, the most efficient option because it may not be the, most, uh, the best choice for your project. And at that point, I'm open for questions. Very good. Lars. Is there any uh, consideration from the California ISO to put a requirement on the renewables to start powering down earlier and soften that ramp, give up some of the energy from the renewables so we double the time for the ramp? I, I'm not that well informed on the California market, but I would very much doubt it because everybody loves renewables. And there's also typically perverse incentives on some of these renewables. They receive income from external arrangements. They don't have to meet market price because they might get a $10 a megawatt subsidy under an agreement. And so they just typically keep generating and to hell with everybody else because they've got their revenue and the rest of the system has to move around to accommodate that. Do you think it would make sense to revise the loading order in California so that uh, you essentially insulated a uh, base load generator like nuclear from the duct? Does it make sense to modify the loading order to better support base load assets like nuclear? And I think that, that does make sense to me. We do need to work within the uh, asset capability, if we want the best efficiency out of these systems, some of those things should be taken into account by the operator. So, to do that loading profile, I'm just curious if there's any large electricity consumers who take a look at that duct and say, wow, that's ridiculous. I want to cut myself off and separate myself from this insanity and go grid independent. Economies of scale normally mean that the economics of a large interconnected grid with large numbers of generators with different price performance points gives you the best economic efficiency overall as opposed to every little pocket of industry building its own assets. Um, that's a less economically efficient solution, so it's typically not. Thank you very much. We're going to keep going. Well, Andrew, what? <laughs> no, no, well, we got to get going. Yeah. Andrew, he's hard to miss. <laughs>